Okay. All right. Well, it looks like we'll be getting started this evening. Thank you, everyone, for joining us either in person or via Zoom. I'll call you Zoomers. Uh, but thank you again. And uh, it is, uh, I'm Nancy Howell. I am one of the board members of Western Cuyahoga Audubon. And I'll be doing a couple of introductory slides. So, Michelle, next, please. That's me. There you go. Um, again, I was welcoming everyone a little earlier, and we were discussing the weather. Um, I, I think it's a little too early to be this warm, so um, I do have some concerns about that. But uh, and I'll mention something uh, coming up in one of the slides. Um, I'll also mention we have several volunteer opportunities for uh, Earth Day events. There are three. Uh, and for those folks in the audience, there are three sign-up sheets at the back for for those uh, events. Uh, the Spring Bird Walk series I'll mention, and of course our e-newsletter, as well as becoming a member. So next please. All right, so World Migratory Bird Day takes place two times a year, the the second Saturday in May and the second- I've got it up. And the second Saturday in October. Um, and please notice their poster this year, protect birds, protect insects, protect birds. Insects are, are crucial to our migratory birds. And of course our local birds as well. You get warm weather like it's happening now, you may get insects that are starting to go through their metamorphosis. You may get things that are hatching out and they're not gonna be available for those migratory species. So again, I'm really concerned about this weather. I know people love it. Um, you wanna get in the garden and clean everything up, but don't, don't clean up your garden yet. Um, but just remember, um, we like birds, we like bats, we like mantids, we like lots of other insect eaters and protect those insects too. Next. All righty, the volunteer opportunities, as I mentioned, uh, we have the sign-up sheets at the back table. So we have Sustainable Berea, the Earth Day event on Saturday, April 20th. Uh, there's two shifts and we'll have a craft activity for kids. We'll have our displays outside uh, and it's at the uh, near Co Lake Park in Berea. So uh, it'll, it's, it's really a lot of fun. It's very nice. Uh, Parma Heights Earth Day takes place the next weekend, April 27th, and that's at Greenbrier Commons. Uh, and again, we'll do the same type of activities and crafts uh, that we did at, uh, at, at the uh, Berea. And then our final one will, is Earth Fest 2024, and that's uh, on Saturday, May 11th. And that is at the West Shore Unitarian Universalist Church. <clears throat> Again, two shifts of volunteers. Uh, we will be doing this, again, the same craft, so everything will be the same. So you can sign up for more than one. You'll be used to it then. How about that? So please take a look at the, uh, at the sign up sheets. Zoomers, please take a look at our website. Next. All right, the Spring Bird Walk series. There's a whole list of areas that uh, from Lorraine County, uh, Geauga County, Lake County, Cuyahoga County, Medina County. Um, set, uh, Sundays, April 4th, starting Sundays, April 14th, 21st, and 28th. And then the first three Sundays in May, 5th, 12th, and 19th. Um, you can attend all one area, you come, keep coming back week after week, or you can go to different places each week. There's so many different areas. Um, the entire list will be on the Western Cuyahoga Audubon website shortly. And uh, so please take a look. Um, there's information about where the walk is taking place, uh, the time, how long the trail is, how rough the trail is, if it's a good idea to wear boots, whatever. So again, we have a little bit more complete information, but I did want to get everybody uh, involved with uh, thinking about the spring bird walk series, 91 years it's been going on. I'm not that old. So I have not been leading that, that long. All right, next please. 
And of course, keep informed with our e-newsletter, sign up, you get, it comes out weekly. If you feel like you're getting too much information, uh, then you can unsubscribe at any time. And of course, uh, to keep our organization running, uh, be, please become a member. And again, all this information is found on the Western Cuyahoga Audubon website. Next, Michelle. All right. Hello, everyone. I'm Michelle Brocious. Hello, Zoomers. We're up to 20 people on Zoom, so welcome. Um, oh, I wanted just to say um, some housekeeping items here. Uh, Zoom, we can hear you if you speak in the room. You're hooked up to the speakers here. Um, so I'm trying my best to keep you all on mute, but please uh, try to also stay on mute until the Q&A at the very end. And also, everyone in the room, People on Zoom cannot hear you if you're not holding a mic. So if you have a question, raise your hand. We'll get a mic out to you. All right. Um, so I'm going to be discussing bird walks and social media. Uh, we have the second Saturday bird walk coming up this Saturday at 9 a.m. at the Rocky River Nature Center. Um, we meet between the upper and lower parking lots and then take a few hours to walk the Nature Center trails. Bill Dininger, Dave Grasskemper, Ken Gober, and Al Rand. Uh, we'll be leading that walk for us, so hope to see you there. Um, I wanted to mention that the second Saturday Bird Walk in May will be held starting from a different parking location. We're still walking the Nature Center trails, but we'll be meeting at the Frostville Museum. The Cleveland Metro Parks has their annual plant sale at the Nature Center and have asked us not to park at the Nature Center because they want to have all those spots for their customers. So that's May only. Uh, we have an afternoon bird walk coming up a Saturday, March 16th at 3 p.m. at Lake Isaac Waterfowl Sanctuary. And that is um, led by my friend, Lynn Shaco. Uh, Tremont Towpath Urban Bird Walk at the end of the month, um, Saturday, March 23rd at 9 a.m. Um, we meet at the Towpath Public Parking Lot on Abbey Avenue, um, just west of Sokolowski's University Inn. Uh, and Nancy Howell and Al Rand are our leaders for that walk. Oh, and then there are so many walks this month. Uh, March kind of starts it all, right? So uh, there is a field trip at Sandy Ridge Reservation on March 30th at 9 a.m. Um, and then I will be leading that walk with my Uncle Bob. So hope to see you there. And then we're on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, or X now, um, Instagram, and YouTube. All of our programs are recorded and put on YouTube, so be sure to subscribe. And if you ever miss one, you can watch it there. All right, that's it for me. Thank you. Thanks, Bunches, uh, Michelle. Uh, Drina, come on down. Or up. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Next slide, please. Well, we're coming up to our third book discussion of the year, and it's an outstanding book, Finding the Mother Tree, Discovering the Wisdom of the Forest by Suzanne Samard. It's quite an amazing book. Um, part of it, a good part of it, is about British Columbia, and I'm finding this really quite uh, astonishing. What is shown on the map there is uh, a mountainous region that she does some of her research on, but she takes us all over a good part of the lower part of British Columbia, also into Washington. And she did her research studies, uh, her PhD in Oregon, so we get some Oregon too. So next slide, please. So uh, it's a personal and scientific work on trees, forest, and the author's profound discoveries of tree communication. Uh, you can find a, many videos about the book and about Suzanne, um, and there's a link there for YouTube. Also, Terry Gross on Fresh Air did a, a wonderful interview with her, and um, the book can be found at our major libraries. Next slide, please. And you can also find our previous discussions um, on our YouTube station. Uh, Vesper Flights is available at this link. And then also our previous book discussions are available too in archives. 
Next slide, please. Oh, and also David Lindo, our friend. Um, he has these wonderful um, series called In Conservation With. And um, his next um, webinar is March 12th and it's called Farming for Nature. Um, last month I shared this, that there's a interview with David Lindo and Ken Kaufman and talking about renaming North American birds. And, uh, you know, in our previous newsletter, we had our lead uh, um, information by Nancy about changing bird names. And it was very, very good introduction to it and a good summary. Um, but Ken goes into it. Oops, I spelled Ken with only one N. Sorry about that. Um, Ken goes into great detail and kind of the history of the um, current issue and also the controversies because it's bringing up a lot of controversy. And um, I think he's trying to really help people to um, be um, very mindful and respectful in their discussions. Um, and then David Lindo also interviewed James Van Resman, Remsen, and he gives a contrary point of view. So very interesting to hear both sides of it. And um, that is it. Thanks much, Lidrina and Amanda. Our coffee coordinator. Hi, I guess there's probably a next slide. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm sure you've heard this spiel before. We sell, uh, oh, we sell um, bird friendly coffee that's certified by the Smithsonian to support our mission, to make some money, and also to support the whole idea of bird-friendly coffee and to teach people uh, why it's important. That being, it's organic, so poisons aren't being poured into yourself and into the land. Um, it's fair trade, so the farmers make more of a living wage, and it's shade-grown, so uh, rainforests aren't clear-cut. Um, this makes it so that the habitat remains. So animals and the birds we love that winter there have a place uh, to live. Um, when you order through uh, the club, you get free shipping, which you wouldn't get if you ordered from another company. Uh, like you could order straight from birds and uh, beans, but you will have to pay shipping. If you do it through the club, you support our mission and you get free shipping but we need to have a minimum order. So please, 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 everyone order. If only it's just one small bag, you're gonna help. Um, and I guess that's about it. The next order goes in April 10th, uh, but you can put your orders in any time. So please go home and put your orders in. Thank you, Amanda. And we also have uh, coffee club cards at the back table. So if you'd like to pick one of those up and or take a bunch home, we got a bunch more here and hand them out to your friends, that would be great. Um, oh, I do wanna mention that uh, the Shreve my, uh, migration sensation is this coming Saturday. Um, I don't have a website here. I just was handed this paper tonight. Uh, so if you Google uh, Shreve Migration Sensation, it will come up and you can look at the information about uh, what's happening there. Uh, I do want to mention that next month, we are, our speaker is Dr. Chris Pappas, a, a veterinarian. No, she does not work on bees, <laughs> but she does study bumblebees, um, which are essential pollinators, native Bumblebee. So this one should be very, very interesting. Next, please. And tonight uh, we have two speakers and it's going to be wonderful. Uh, more birds, please. Focus condition assessment. Birds of the Cuyahoga, of uh, birds of concern, conservation concern in the Cuyahoga Valley National Park. 
And but we have both Doug Markham and Ryan Trimbath, who are biologists for the CVNP. Uh, all right, next. And our speakers uh, kindly sent uh, bios and awesome photos. I, I like Doug's in the black and white, and he's by the tree, very old timey looking. Um, but as you see, uh, a long time nature nut and bird lover. Uh, he's worked as a biologist for the National. I'm sorry, what? For the National Park Service for really? over ten years. Um, and he's uh, done inventory and monitoring uh, division, most of the work involving wetlands, invasive species, birds, and amphibians through long-term monitoring, monitoring protocols. Uh, main hobbies include getting lost in the woods <laughs> and bird watching. Uh, and maybe many of you will remember Ryan Trimbath, uh, who spoke with us when we were at the Rocky River Nature Center on the uh, Northern Perula Cerulean Warbler Hybrid that was located, as you can see from the last line, uh, in two years uh, in the Cuyahoga Valley National Park. But again, Ryan is a biologist with CVNP, uh, been there eight years, and he has his degree from uh, in wildlife conservation, uh, wildlife and conservation biology from Ohio University then traveled around the country working as a field biologist on various research projects, honing his skills as a field biologist and pursuing his interests in forest and avian ecology. So this evening, please welcome Doug Markham and Ryan Trimbath uh, for our presentation. How about a nice round of applause? Next, Next slide. Thank you. And so we're looking forward to it. All right, just give me a minute to switch the presentations. Um, folks on Zoom, I have put in the chat a handout uh, for you to download that the presenters have provided. If you don't see it in the chat, uh, just chat that to me and I will um, put it through again. This is our first time uh, dance doing this dance together, so uh, we're going to be switching off a little bit, presenting this information, so bear with us if it's a little bit awkward. Thank you. That's it. And thanks, Nancy, and, and thanks for having us here. It's great to be uh, in the building with the Audubon Society. Um, when I was in Kent State, I had a, a bird club, and we used to just do this kind of the same thing and just nerd out about birds, and so it's good to be back. Um, more birds, please, was kind of the title of this. I'm just going to give a quick backstory on that. We, we, the three of us, myself, Ryan, and then another one of our biologists, Maria Mar Gutierrez Ramirez is in the audience and she's helped us a lot with this work. Um, but we're, we're all three just huge, uh, bird conservation people. And we had a chance to do this project. So that's kind of where the title came from. We just wanted to study birds more. We want to provide more for birds. Um, but just a quick off the cuff intro on there. Sorry, Ryan. Oh, all good. Okay, it's me, right? Yep. Um, all right, so we just wanna kind of start up. Remember, we are representing the National Park Service, uh, the green and gray. Doug has his blue on. So Doug is technically not employed by Cuyahoga Valley National Park. Doug is part of the Heartland Inventory and Monitoring Division. So inventory is a huge part of the National Park Service, right? Um, the Cuyahoga Valley National Park, does anyone know how old we are, Cuyahoga Valley? Getting, well, we were designated as a national recreation area first. So uh, we've been part of the national park system for, this is be, our, be 50 years in December. Um, so, uh, with that, you know, when you establish a national park, the first thing is you got to know what's there, right? So in the 1980s, we had our first plant inventory done by Barb Andreas from Kent State, a great botanist. She did a plant survey of the Cuyahoga Valley National Rec Area. Um, another group of Kent State professors, uh, Sam um, uh, Mazur? Yeah, Mazur, Mazur, uh, did, a, did a, a survey in the 1980s. Um, but yeah, like what, what's here, right? Like we have this land now, what's here? Um, and a lot has changed with the park since the 1980s. We've acquired a lot more land. 
right? We've, we've acquired recently the um, uh, former Brandywine Golf Course. Uh, woods around Blossom. There's been a lot of new acquisitions and we're constantly chasing this idea of inventory, of knowing what we have, right? Um, the Park Service knew that there's this need and in uh, early 2000s, there, there was initiative to create uh, inventory and monitoring divisions. So Doug is with the Heartland Inventory and Monitoring Network. We, Cuyahoga Valley National Park, are within that network. In addition to the networks, there's a Washington office inventory and monitoring division, which leads national level uh, initiatives for inventory. But inventory, it's extremely important. We, anything we do, we have to make sure we're not having negative impacts on the, the, the natural system, right? So you might think, oh, National Park, what could you do that's impacting uh, uh, nature and the species that are there? Well, we are stabilizing roughly three miles of riverbank almost. Um, we have a train track. We have a, a, a towpath. We're putting in parking lots. We're demolish, demoing buildings. We're doing all these things, right? And we have to know what's what the, the species are that are present and understand what our impacts might be to them. So the inventory serves as that key backbone for everything that we do is knowing what, what we have, right? Um, it's not advanced. Yeah, not quite. Where are we going to aim it at? There you go. Okay. So then in addition to inventory, we want to monitor, right? Well, how are things changing over time? I personally have uh, a forest um, long-term plots that I monitor to look at forest health. It informs our deer management program, understanding how things are changing. And in that case, we can see if things are going in the wrong direction, if there's something we can do, uh, take an action. But alternatively, uh, if we take an action of restoration, right, um, we can monitor those sites to see how they're doing. Uh, determine if action is needed, understand the impacts of those actions, uh, and which then leads to management. So our goals with the National Park Service, you know, we are concerned about species conservation, but we don't really do single species management per se. We're focused on preserving all native species and preserving those natural processes that allow things to, to persist. And being part of a national system, we, we put ourselves in context and try to understand how can we at Cuyahoga Valley, so you might see this CUVA, CUVA, a lot of people see CVNP, but in, in the National Park Service, we use a four letter acronym of CUVA. So if you see that, that's, uh, that's what we're talking about. How can we contribute to the regional, national and global conservation science and stewardship? Well, thanks, Ryan. <clears throat> uh, so, so getting started with birds. So what do we know about birds um, as a backdrop to this? Well, you guys are probably well aware there's been some depressing news lately, and we may have not needed the news to know that, you know, birds have been declining. So sadly, we've lost 3 billion birds um, in North America since 1970, a big study, a big paper that came out in science in 2019. Um, so losing 3 billion birds looks something like that in this, <laughs> in this diagram here. Uh, each one of those represents a billion birds. So furthermore, 70 species of North American birds are at a tipping point, uh, which they define as having lost at least 50% of their population and could stand to lose another 50% by 2050 if, if something isn't remedied. Um, so that's, that's a big deal. Um, and that kind of is raising a lot of alarms. What's going on with the birds? Um, so from that paper, um, there was a nice graph there. Um, well, the content isn't very nice, but you know it's, it depicts the story well. Um, birds in almost every habitat type or category are declining, aside from one group. Birds that are, that are either associated with wetlands are mainly uh, geese and swans or, and duck. Oh, dabbling in diving ducks is just below that. Does anybody have any idea why there's, that's the anomaly? Why are uh, birds associated with wetlands such as geese, swans, and ducks doing well while all other birds are declining? No cats, that could help. The big things are, so wetlands are federally protected, or at least they, they have been since the 70s. And, and there's a little aside there now where we might be losing some of those protections. So hopefully that doesn't, hopefully that's not going to be the case, um, but it kind of already is. Um, but also um, think about uh, Ducks Unlimited. Think about all the people that the private organizations that um, are interested in waterfowl, waterfowl hunting, waterfowl conservation. So there's a lot of agencies that are um, 
public and private who are um, interested in duck and uh, migratory waterfowl conservation. Oh, no worries. Yeah, you can. Thank you. Um, so yeah, all the all the birds are more or less declining. And then at the bottom there, you see in the red, I don't know if I have a laser pointer here. I probably shouldn't press any buttons on this, but um, birds, uh, the tipping point species are the, the red line at the bottom. So they're just doing, you know, it's it's a rough time out there. Uh, but but I like to look at this slide as a silver lining with the, the birds that we have tried to provide habitat for have only increased since 1970. So to me, that's a silver lining. Brian's going to talk about cool. this one. Yeah, so we've seen that birds are declining really uh, globally. Um, but what's going on at Cuyahoga Valley National Park? Like that's something we can control in a sense, maybe. We, we like to think we can control, right? Um, and so in order for resource managers to understand what's going on with the resources in their park, the National Park Service uh, did what's called a natural resource condition assessment. This is a document you can find online if you're interested. It's like three, 600, some crazy number of pages. Um, it covers all sorts of resources from night skies to, uh, to birds and plants and everything in between. Um, and some of them they do a really good job with. This is an example of what the table looks like from the bird section. Um, for every resource, they break it down by these different indicators. So native species richness, or, uh, uh, index of biotic integrity. And then they tell you um, these symbols have a, have a variety of, of forms they can come in. So uh, the arrows going side to side mean we think it's kind of stable. There's no significant change. You might see those arrows going up or down. Yellow represents, uh, oh, I don't have my notes. Moderate concern. moderate concern, green being least concern. There's a whole key to it. I had notes on my slide, but I don't see them right now. But anyways, when we started to look at our the condition of our birds in the natural resource condition assessment, being the bird nerds that we are, we were like, man, they missed a lot of information. And this has left a lot to be desired. Well, luckily, the Park Service um, brought out, so yeah, we, we, we identified there's, there's more data available. So they just use a limited data set um, that it didn't cover things like forest birds. So again, limited. We, we, we had a lot of information that we, we knew was out there and wanted to see. <laughs> um, it's not going again. But um, you click it. There we go. Okay, so, so the Park Service, sort of realizing some of these challenges, they created a new initiative called the Focus Condition Assessment. And that's the term you saw earlier. This is what we're presenting on, where... Uh, we can take an area, uh, a topic of interest um, where we have some need for more information and, and use existing data mainly to strengthen our understanding of current resource conditions in the parks, to improve delivery of best available science to parks, and uh, again, emphasizing on the exist use, utilization of uh, existing data sets. So here we are with the focus condition assessment birds of conservation concern okay so that's what the list is in front of you there we went to uh there was a document published by u.s fish and wildlife service in 2021 it was the birds of conservation concern a list of bird species that if we don't take action now will eminently be potentially listed as threatened or endangered at some point in the future. So these are species where Fish and Wildlife Service has determined either at a national or regional level, they uh, we need to take action now or they're gonna keep declining. Um, we also have species on there that are uh, listed in the state of Ohio. Um, so there's 30 total species. Uh, nine of them are on the continental list. You can see the columns on that sheet are marking which are which. Um, and then we're in uh, the, the Great Lakes region. Um, 13 species from there, and then 23 additional species from the Ohio list. Well, not additional species, but 23 of those species are on the Ohio list as well. And you guys had a chance to ID those birds before we put the names up there just for fun. So hopefully you did that to yourselves. Cool. So Cuyahoga Valley National Park, how many you bird there? Does anybody who birds there? Okay, come on down. Lots of birds to see, right? Uh, we are an important bird area, so it's the lower Cuyahoga River important bird area as defined by the Audubon. 
Um, but in the general terms, it's definitely an important bird area, right? Over 250 species can be seen across the 33,000 acres within the park boundary. Uh, the diversity of birds is driven by the diversity of habitats, right? You can go to upland forest, grasslands, wetlands, all sorts of places. And I'm guessing many of you have been to Station Road, uh, Ira Road, Beaver Marsh, or Coliseum grasslands. So birds are a big part of our landscape. Um, so with that list and this interest in understanding the birds of conservation concern and how they're doing in Ohio or in uh, the National Park, Cuyahoga Valley, we identified a number of data sets that we thought we could put to use to understand what the trends are for these birds within our park, right? So the eBird data set, oh, my animation messed up, that's why it's yellow there. So eBird data set, I hope a lot of you contribute your data to eBird. Uh, eBird has data dating back all the way to 1956. Uh, we're aware of, and Doug participates in, the Greater Akron Audubon Society Summer Bird Census, which dates back to 1978. We have records from the Ohio Breeding Bird Atlas in the 1982. Uh, really cool data set, the Brecksville spot mapping data from 1941 uh, and some, some surveys uh, through that time period. Um, HTLN, that's for Heartland. That's, you know, Doug's inventory monitoring. So Heartland Wetland Breeding Bird Survey is a one of the projects and uh, USGS breeding bird data. So we know there was a lot of data that wasn't utilized in that natural resource condition assessment that we can look at. Um, the two yellow ones here are the ones we're gonna talk about today. So the eBird data and the Heartland Wetland Breeding Bird Survey. And that's where I pass it over to Doug. Cool, so yeah, I'm gonna start off by talking about the Wetland Breeding Bird Survey. Um, so, uh, this survey was initiated in 2012. I started in the park in 2011. In 2012, I was out doing wetland monitoring, um, and we had a bunch of sites, at really nice locations across the park, you know, and I'm out there collecting hydrologic uh, monitoring data, and I'm just being distracted by the birds. So <laughs> I have about five minutes of downtime while I'm waiting for my water chemistry sample to process, and I'm just counting birds. I'm like, well, I should just start, you know, collecting data. So I, I actually turned it into just a point count that I would do when I was at my sites doing my water chemistry, ended up with a data set. And then um, my supervisor and her boss decided, you know, why don't we just publish this into a report? You collected all the data. So that's how this study got started. And then in 2017, um, they were like, well, I pointed out a lot of holes in the, in the um, methodology because, you know, I, sometimes I was out there at 1230 p.m. And anybody knows, I mean, if you're going to go count birds, you're not going to go count them in the afternoon. So um, we made it a targeted effort in, effort in 2017, and then we repeated the survey in 2023. Um, so we have data from three years. So the, the way we look at it is um, basically more so as an inventory um, that we've uh, accumulated information, more information over time. And if the effort continues, it, it can be considered more of a monitoring effort, and we can start to look at trends. But right now, we're basically just considering it an inventory that's been um, building for I guess about a decade. So it's a single observer myself um, doing repeated point counts uh, uh, during the breeding season um, from 30 point locations across wetlands in the in the national park. And, and that's what the map depicts on the right, just to give you an idea that the, the sites that I'm surveying at are distributed across the park. Um, so if any of you are uh, familiar with breeding bird survey methodology, this is the master list of breeding codes that you use. Um, when you're documenting birds in the breeding season, um, we have things such as, um, so an example of these, uh, this Oriole feeding its, its young, we would say that that is uh, either you could say fledged young or um, carrying food. Both of those are considered confirmed breeding status. Well, I mean, it's kind of obvious looking at the picture that they were breeding in that area, but that's an example of a confirmed breeding evidence. And then another one up here, anyone know what bird that is? It's a hard one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Acadian flycatcher. Yep. She's building her nest. So, you know, once again, in that confirms category, we have nest building, uh, NB nest building observed. And then another example, some pileated woodpecker young, um, a nest, um, occupied nest or, uh, let's see, nest with young. Yep. NY nest with young. So these are just examples when I'm out doing these point counts, I'm basically trying to gather as much evidence as I, as I can about breeding. 
And you know, these are the things that you really want to see to confirm that breeding. Um, but we have some other codes like, you know, you go out to a site and you hear a male singing over and over, over the course of three weeks while you're there. Well, that's not confirmation, but it is probable if you have a, you know, it's considered a probable code. If you have a male out there that's on territory week after week, or if you see agitated behavior or territorial behaviors, just some of these things are indicating that there's probably breeding going on, but you haven't confirmed it yet. So um, just an overall summary of uh, what's been found uh, on this study. So 102 species have been observed to date from this effort. 47 of those have been documented breeding and 23 probable breeders. Um, and so of that list of 30 species of conservation concern, um, 15 of those have been documented on this effort. So just the list on the slide there um, for who, who we documented uh, being confirmed breeding and probable during this study. And then <laughs> one of the most exciting finds this year is, I know it's a really great picture. <laughs> was it, was it, can anyone tell what that is? I mean, it's on the list. So on the confirmed list. What is that, Chia? Yeah, the brown creeper. So yeah, we found a pair of, uh, there's some singing brown creepers, which was already exciting because, you know, brown creepers aren't super common in the breeding season around the park. Um, but then we uh, kind of staked them out and and got to witness a feeding. And you know, my, my camera was out of focus and a little underexposed, but either way, it's evidence. Um, and then another one that was also really exciting, we found a couple instances of winter wrens outside of the ledges. If anyone knows that the winter wrens uh, breed at the ledges at the Cuyahoga Valley. Well, we found um, two instances in other areas as well. So there's a young, uh, a fledgling winter wren. So what do we, what can we say about trends though? So like I kind of already uh, said to you in the beginning about this study, we didn't really design it to, um, it wasn't, I, I should say, it wasn't really designed to be sound enough to be able to look at trends across the time span yet, um, but we're hopefully getting there. But that being said, um, with the data that we have to this point, I think that we can speculate a little bit on trends. And I figured just for the purpose of interesting conversation, we do that here. Um, oops, now I'm having that. Okay. So I just wanted to highlight a few birds. So this table here that you're going to see over the next few slides um, is more or less just raw data of the frequency. Uh, so basically the percentage of sites in which these birds were um, detected at during each of the three years of survey. So if you look at the bottom, the most important thing to recognize is that in 2012, like I said, we were just getting started. It wasn't necessarily the best survey effort, but I did survey at 22 sites, but then the other two years, it's more or less 30 sites. So that's why I'm using a percentage to show how frequent these birds were across the years of survey. So not deeply scientifically sound, but like I said, just for comparative purposes and and um, just speculation anyway. Um, so chimney swifts. In 2017, you know, chimney swifts were popping up at half of half of the sites that I went out to. But for whatever reason, 2023, you know, that number dropped to just a little over a quarter of the sites. So that kind of just stands out to me. I mean, you know, chimney swifts are a known species of decline of late. Insectivores in general are having big problems. Um, you know, th th those slides that we had before this, we're talking about insect conservation. I mean, you know, with all the pesticides and everything that's out there, a lot of insectivores are potentially in trouble. Other things that with chimney swifts, I mean, they're, they're nesting sites. They use a lot of artificial structures, old industrial buildings, even, even residential chimneys. I have some nesting at my house <laughs> and I don't even, I'm not, I'm not going to cap my chimney. So um, and then also in their wintering grounds, um, they're having problems as well. So chimney swifts are having some issues and we may be, you know, we'll know once we get a couple more years worth of data, but we may be starting to see a decline in chimney swifts. Two birds that might actually be faring uh, better um, that we're starting to see here, um, blue wing warblers and redheaded woodpeckers. So emerald ash borer came through about the time when I started in the park 2011 and you know, over the next several years, um, ash trees just died off massively. And so this just causes a massive amount of light to be flooding through the canopy. And then like this image on the left here, you can, is kind of a good representation of what a lot of our wetlands look like now, which it's actually kind of awesome. It's in my mind, it's a very productive habitat. Um, you got lush herbaceous growth in the understory. 
Um, sometimes it's a, a, a strong woody component as well with shrubs and saplings. Um, but then as well, you have all these um, dead standing trees that the redheaded woodpeckers will be nesting in. They don't like the closed canopy forests too. Well. I mean, they will use them, but they prefer more open canopy forests. And then the blue wing warblers prefer kind of open canopy, scrubby, wet areas as well. So the numbers show, you know, blue wing warblers increasing a little bit over time and redheaded woodpeckers um, definitely showing a little bit of an increase from the 2012 effort. Um, another species that kind of caught my eye when I just glanced at this table, uh, wood thrush. To me, um, I was picking up wood thrush this last year in sites that I just don't remember ever really hearing them more like uh, younger growth edge habitat. And um, I kind of always in my mind associated wood thrushes with more of a forest species, like in a forest understory kind of species. But so um, in more, we need to look into this more, but it almost seems like they might be making like a slight shift into use, utilizing more edge habitat. And, and like I said, this is just a speculation that I'm picking up on, on my sites that I've seen. So um, if anyone else has any thoughts on that. I'd be interested to talk about it later, but this is something that we might look into a little bit more. And we haven't confirmed too many nesting observations like in, you know, an early successional or an edge habitat. Um, but either way, it just seems like uh, kind of something that might be going on there. It's good that they're doing well. And then uh, the last one is um, this slide here. I'm covering uh, dark-eyed junco and winter wren. It, um, so they're both on the increase. Dark-eyed juncos have been making an increase um, over the last decade or so, just popping up in more places in forests uh, across. Brexville Reservation is a really good area. They've got some old forests there, but also just across the park with the closed canopy and um, deep valley forests and stuff like that. Winter wrens kind of like the same thing. Um, both of these birds are kind of benefiting from the maturing forest, um, in my opinion. And uh, winter wrens particularly like areas that have a lot of dead, um, downed uh, woody debris. And we've got all the valleys and stuff for them. They like a lot of topography. So, um, yeah, and that's the that's basically the summary of the Wetland Breeding Bird Survey. We'll turn it over to Ryan to talk a little bit about eBird. Cool. eBirders, yeah, great, great tool. Uh, why do you use eBird? because I've been asked to. Oh, okay. I, I yeah. Things. Yes, I think. Very good. And anyone else, why do you use eBird? Anybody? Just doing what you're told to? Ex exactly, yes. So it's great tool, and it, they've really done a lot to help individuals curate their data sets. Um, it's a huge data set curated by Cornell Lab of Ornithology. So the best of the best ornithologists in the in North America here and globally, really. Um, massive global citizen science project. Checklists are submitted with minimal requirements, right? You can okay. kind of, you can kind of <laughs> do what you, uh, what you want to do with them. Um, and there's a ton of data, right? So globally, over 10,000, almost 11,000 species um, documented, 90 million checklists, and almost a million eBirders. Um, so it's a really awesome resource. We use it all the time. I look at it, if I'm like, hey, where's the cerulean? Where's the viri? Where, whatever species I'm looking for, I, I look at eBird or ask Doug, um, <laughs> you know, or, or somebody else from the birding community. But, uh, but yeah, it was, um, you know, so over 20, you know, we knew this was a rich data set, specifically at Cuyahoga Valley, 27,000 eBird checklists submitted between 2007 and 2022. Uh, we knew that there was something here that we should look into. Um, and again, it goes back to 1956. A lot of historic data has been uploaded onto there, but really taking off and, uh, you know, since 2000, 2010, so later. Um, but again, the eBird data, uh, like you said, collected kind of like for curating your own lists, right? And so the challenge of understanding what, how we can use that data to understand trends in birds is something that people at Cornell are trying to figure out and also people like us who are um, managing park resources are, want to use. So what, what have we learned? So this is Megan Spina. She was one of our interns from last year uh, through a scientists in park program that we have. 
Uh, we funded her through the focus condition assessment and she came in with some really good experience and knowledge and using R and coding and data analysis. So we put her to work <laughs> on these data sets um, to look at, you know, what's going on, what's the general trend. So this first slide is, you know, what, what is the trend? What are we seeing through this time on eBird observations? So for these uh, species of conservation concern, 40% of the species increased in total observations over a period of time from 2007 to 2022. So more birds, we're seeing more birds. 53% uh, of the species were observed at more hot spots. So you record your locations by hot spots. So that was really exciting. And none of the species showed any negative trends. It was all up and up. We we're in good shape, right? So cerulean warbler, this is an example of the way we started exploring our data. So we have two things we're graphing here. We have hot spots and number of observations. So the red line follows the number of hot spots. We're like, oh man, these, these ceruleans are popping up in more places throughout the park, right? Awesome. And then, you know, observations. Oh my goodness, look at all these observations. It's going up. We're doing a great job. We're, we're protecting them from cowbirds. We're planting more trees. We're, you, know, you know, too good to be true, I think. <laughs> uh, whoop, did we move, lose a slide? Okay. Is this me? Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue this, this line of thought here. So yeah, on the list on the left here is uh, all the species that we saw more observations over time. Um, so, you know, a good chunk, 40% of that list. And then the list of species on the right are the species that we're showing at more sites over time. So like Ryan said, I mean, this is awesome. You know, we're just, we're seeing more birds, but uh, there might be an issue here. So, you know, <laughs> there's, there's some birders out in the, on the towpath in national park. Here's some birders out at McGee Marsh. Um, I, so what the issue is, is these data that we're looking at are not being scaled for effort. What we're what we're seeing is an effect of just lots of birders contributing lots of data, which is great, but we have to find a way to filter through all these data and make sense of it. So that was kind of like the beginning of our journey. It's like you know we, like Ryan illustrated, we first started out looking at what was observed and we're like okay, look at all these trends. So um, here's an example of a couple checklists that were um, submitted to eBird recently, uh, both on the same day. Um, but a very different type of checklist. So on the on the left hand side, you see an example of just one person that was out for 45 minutes in the afternoon, documenting nine species, and it's an incomplete checklist. So maybe they were just out walking their dog and they just logged a few birds. And then on the right, you see an example of a of a definite dedicated effort from actually the Ira Road birders, um, but uh, eight people out for almost four hours covering three miles, starting at 7:30. So a very different result. So right away, we know we can't really be comparing apples to apples with just eBird checklists because there's so many things that can, can differ in the amount of effort. So how can we try to correct for the level of effort and in, in, in look at these data? So uh, the first thing we did was try to look at um, percentage of checklists in which um, these conservation species were, um, were recorded on. So, you know, even if we had a thousand checklists in 2010 and 10,000 in 2015, well, we just want to know out of all those checklists, how many, what proportion were these species detected on? So when we looked at it that way, um, common merganser was the only species that showed a positive trend where it was being detected on a greater percentage of checklists over time. Um, and we thought about that and, you know, that could, that could be a real thing. I mean, we, we've seen in the park and we've kind of, if any of you bird, uh, around the area or on the river, the mergansers have been making their way into, into our region, um, and becoming more prevalent. So we think that is reflecting a real trend, but there also is the fact that more people have been also getting out on the river. So, you know, we could, have we teased that apart per se? It's hard to say. Um, the, the list of species on the right are all species that have shown decline when we looked at the data this way. And this seems um, fairly reasonable. Uh, this, the three species that are highlighted are species um, that have been uh, labeled as species that have been just losing ground um, their whole re region-wide. So kingfisher, black-billed cuckoo, sharp-shinned hawk, these birds are on a list of, con of concern for 
Um, I think most of them are actually, t- well, not, I, I shouldn't say most of them. I know sharp shinned hawk and black billed cuckoo. I think those are two of the tipping point species. Um, but anyway, so some of these numbers seem to have, um, captured an actual loss in birds, but we're still not super convinced with this. So the next thing we looked at was, okay, can we break it down by birds per party hour? Well, what does that mean? It's just, it doesn't matter if you had one person out or eight people out. Um, if you're birding for one hour, you're birding for one hour. And during that one hour of a complete checklist, that, that's kind of in the background. It has to be a complete effort. Um, you know, how many birds were detected per amount of time. So we're once again, just trying to scale for that level of effort. So when we looked at it this way, um, three species came out with increasing trends over time, redheaded woodpecker, rose-breasted grosbeak, and veery. Um, and these three species, I mean, from I, I, we don't have any other evidence to suggest like, well, I don't know about that. I mean, it, like I just mentioned in my um, in the, in the breeding bird survey, you know, we, we showed redhead woodpeckers and that one going up as well. And some of these other species are kind of benefiting from some of the thick undergrowth, uh, whether it be invasive species, uh, understory or not. Um, you know, the, the gross beak and the veery like to nest in some of the un- understory there. So, um, these trends seem fairly reasonable. Um, and we actually zoomed in on these trends a little bit more and, and did, uh, Megan, Megan did all this. Um, did analysis on um, the the three top hot spots within the national park um, and looked at localized trends. So you can see, you know, Station Road has two hot spots depending on what side of the uh, river you're on, two different counties. Um, so, you know, they're increasing on the one side and decreasing on the other side. So maybe there's some localized thing that happened there or, but overall in the park, they're, they're increasing. Um, a few of the species that we um, see, um, in this analysis, declining belted kingfisher, once again, um, wood thrush, blue wing warbler, bobbling. The blue wing warbler is interesting. Um, you know, in my, in the wetland breeding survey, I show that species increasing across the sites that I monitor, but in this eBird analysis, we're showing a decrease in birds per party hour over time. So the jury is a little bit still out on that one. Um, yeah, we, we have to look into it more. I mean, that's, that's honestly where we're at right now, but uh, just, you know, sharing these, uh, these early results, with, well, uh, of what we have so far with you guys, um, you know, bobolink, we know that the grassland birds and stuff like that are in trouble. The Coliseum has been more or less stable over time, but you know, it's not just about what's happening at the Coliseum for these birds. So, um, zooming in on the Kingfisher, just another example of how we kind of looked at particular sites. So, once we really get to the point where we can drill down on what we think is going on with some of these birds, having this analysis right here, where we can look at specific hot spots to, to understand further part of the story of what's going on. Why, why are they decreasing significantly at station road? Well, what, you know, what's happened there? Have they lost something that they once had, et cetera. So that's kind of, and we have this analysis for all the birds that we looked at. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about, um, troubles with the eBird analysis. So it kind of alluded to a little bit of it already, but the biggest three things, level of effort varies widely. So even if you're out there doing a complete checklist early in the morning and you're doing the best you can, you know, eBird uh, uh, observer skill varies. You know, some people are, can identify every single thing they hear and see, or they can spot things that a lot of people like me wouldn't even see when they're walking by. Um, you know, that varies time spent, distance traveled, all, all makes a difference time of day, time of year, you know, just where are you at? What's, what's the weather like our birds calling that day? Um, another one is that hot spots are not geographically bound. This is a big one. Um, so habitats can be included or excluded. So we have a hot spot, Virginia Kendall Lake. It's a really nice area. There's a decent sized lake. Uh, surrounded by marshy wetlands, a little bit of marshy wetlands. And then you've, uh, you've got some forests, you've got some big hills where we've got prairie warblers that um, can be found in the summer. So we've got this big mix of habitats, but if someone's going to go survey that site or they're going to do an eBird checklist for that site, it's hard to say where they actually walk. Did they just walk over to the pond and, and count a few birds there and then go back home? Or did they do the whole loop and get in all the habitats? So if you if two people are birding at the same location, we can't expect to compare that if we don't know exactly, you know, they didn't go to the exact same places. 
And then sampling is just biased in general. Hot spots are well sampled. So those those spots that everybody knows, like Station Road, um, Beaver Marsh, Coliseum, people are going to those sites all the time because they know there's birds there. Um, well, there's a lot of other sites in the national park that maybe don't have good parking or just people don't know about them. There's no trail. Well, there's, there's definitely good birds there too. Um, and then birders are often targeting rare species. So um, we had an example of that's not in this presentation, but a sedge wren was documented like an ex extreme amount of times and it just like blew up on the data, but it's, well, it's because once it was found at the Coliseum, you know, lots of people went out there and, and, and documented it. So. Um, so best practices, what can we do to improve the, um, uh, the usefulness of these data? So, um, anytime you're doing an eBird, um, checklist, trying to do a complete checklist is huge. So for example, the analysis that we did and the analysis that Cornell does with their data, they only look at complete checklists. So if you, if you do an incidental checklist, like I do a lot of times, because I'm driving by and I saw something cool and I want to record it, well, those data aren't going to get captured into major analysis um include breeding codes so anytime it's the breeding season and you see any sort of behavior that could um you know give breeding evidence include that because that really helps um and then just adding notes in general and then a couple other things that aren't necessarily like general ebird practices but that might relate with ebird so contribute to projects and follow protocols so um this is something that we're going to explore uh coming uh, going forward um I'm pretty sure you can use eBird to contribute to a project similarly to how you can do it with um, iNaturalist. And if there's sp uh, specific protocols that you can be contributing to um, a project, because if, if we have a specific set of instructions and everybody's following it, then we can compare those data directly. Um, and one thing that we'd like to do in the national park is to establish point count stations. So. For example, if you've ever been to the beaver marsh and you go out onto the boardwalk and there's just an observation area, if we had a point count station established there, anybody could just walk up to that site and say, okay, I'm at the beaver marsh point count location. I'm going to go on eBird now and bird for five minutes and um, contribute, you know, a five minute point count. And we can, we'd like to establish these across the park at some of our important areas. And that way, anytime someone contributes data to that particular protocol um, e via eBird, we can compare those data directly. So those are just a couple of things. And this checklist here is just an example of, you know, one of mine that I submitted that has, you know, breeding codes listed, complete checklist, and, uh, you know, some comments. I should have put one of Chia's up here. He's got a lot of pictures and audio with all his. He's a really good, really diligent eBirder. Um. You have to remind me when you're up, but okay, sure. Okay. Uh, so another thing we did last year is we engaged volunteers to, to help us, um, track down some breeding behavior of some of the species on the list there. Um, so we, we called it the volunteer breeding confirmation survey. Um, basically what we did was we handed out that same list that you all have and said, we really want to find out more about what these birds are doing in the park. We have some, we know where they've been seen thus far in eBird here, here you go. Here's the sites. Um, basically just go out and watch these birds and see if you can nail down any evidence of breeding. So through that effort, we ended up having 10 volunteers contribute data, 283 total observations and 21 of our 30 species were observed. Um, eight of those were confirmed breeding through this effort. Um, and that's the table here. And then one was probable. Um, so yeah, that was awesome. I mean, the just extra data that we got that we, you know, wouldn't have had otherwise, um, get a little bit of context for these birds. And I actually included Cerulean Warbler on this, um, on this table because I just, I thought it was an interesting talking point. So we didn't document, um, any uh, for sure breeding confirmation of this bird, but Ryan being the Cerulean Warbler expert that he is and, uh, aficionado you know, spent a lot of time chasing cerulean warblers in the park. I mean, I went out a couple of times, our intern went out, we couldn't nail down any breeding evidence. Um, we saw some interesting behavior where males were chasing a female around and some possible territorial behavior, but just goes to show how tough some of these birds can be to study. Um, and so we really just want to need to put more effort in and figure out what's actually going on. And I guess another point that you, 
have often liked to make is that even though we see a bird out, you know, singing and displaying and, oh, there's the cerulean warblers, that's great. Are they actually breeding? Well, we don't really know. Are they successfully breeding? We don't know. And until we see that evidence, like, you know, we hope they are, but we're not 100% sure. Yeah. And <clears throat> Cerulean Warbler is a good example of that. Station Road is a place where it kind of consistently can find breeding success. I, I didn't go there because I knew people were hopefully breeding, uh, birding there. Uh, I was focusing on areas where people don't regularly bird. Uh, but that's a, a, an example where we can find a male singing. And often uh, in fragmented habitats of marginal quality, uh, birds often end up just spending the summer alone. And a male who's alone all summer will sing all summer. If he's breeding, he's going to get quiet, you know? So that's a species that we've seen a lot of records of, but we really want to try to nail down breeding evidence and, and confirmation. Same thing with prairie warblers. So prairie warbler is not on here. We know that they successfully breed some years at the Virginia Kendall Hills. Um, but uh this year we chased those birds around uh, last year. Well, so last year we chased the birds around and, and um, didn't find any confirmed breeding. The previous year we did find a nest with eggs, which failed and never found a re-nest again. So it's just a lot of complicated stuff going on. And, and while we know that our habitat attracts males to the, to the area, um, knowing where the successful territories are and if there's actions like with the prairie warbler, right? We, they're there because we keep mowing the the area and managing it in a successional condition. Um, but there's there's different ways of of implementing that mow program, and uh, we want to make sure that we're doing it in a way that can maintain the biodiversity. So this is our first step in that direction, right? Um, getting more data. And there's a picture of a junko carrying food. <laughs> cool. So I think this is me for, for next steps. Um, this has been a really challenging project. So the, like Doug's been working really hard on this. Megan worked really hard. They, they spent like months just curating the data sets, pulling it all together. The greater Akron Audubon society data set. They had to go to the peninsula library or uh, Akron library to go into the archives and get things digitized and things like that. Efforts like that are, uh, it's been a huge lift. And so, Megan in her time, we didn't even get a chance to start analyzing that one data set. Um, so we have a, a lot more work to do. Continued analysis. Um, we hope with that continued analysis, it, you might be looking at us. So what did you find out? What'd you figure out? We're still trying to figure out what we figured out, you know? So we're hoping that as we get all these data sets together, something will emerge, right? Um, as Doug mentioned, the projects idea or the, the point count stations, we're hoping to we know eBird is the probably the most powerful tool for us. Uh, easiest thing for us to do for long-term monitoring would be to, to not say, oh, this eBird data is crazy. We can't use it. But it's to harness that energy and harness that resource to meet our needs. So we're not saying we need everybody to change the way they do things, but uh, we want to tap into it. So we'll, we'll keep you in the loop on that. Um, really excited. We tried out something new again this past season where we just, uh, deployed, they're called, some people call them ARUs, auto, automatic recording units, song meters, things that we put out in the field and can record bird song. Um, we're working on the, the, pro, the processing of data from last year. And this is a tool we believe will help us really find those secretive marsh birds, give us, give us a better chance of detecting rare species, but also have a consistent methodology for when Doug moves on to whatever he does in the future, or I move on, or we have a consistent methodology where the observer is not um, uh, dictating sort of the, the variability in the data set. And, and yeah, at some point we'll have a full report. We'll send it out to you guys to, to review and, uh, and, and read. But yeah, once all that stuff comes together, we'll be um, synthesizing it into the focus condition assessment for birds of conservation concern at Cuyahoga Valley National Park. <laughs> um, and kind of in, in closing, Doug, feel free to chime in here, but uh, you know we're trying to do our part. We know bird conservation is the global issue. I think you all have made that very aware as well. So we think of Cuyahoga Valley National Park as an important place um, for birds, uh, but they're, they, migratory birds specifically, have a lot of challenges, right? They have to get from their wintering grounds to their breeding grounds, and there's just disturbances all along the way. So what can we do as our part, right? Provide that critical habitat as a uh, 
migratory stopover um, uh, for refueling. And then when they show up to nest, let's do what we can to, to, to make it the best nesting breeding habitat that they can. Um, so if we can take measures, do habitat management to increase that breeding success, that's, that's kind of what we're interested in. It's a delicate balance, right? So we, we have a lot of efforts to increase the amount of forest. Chris Davis, our plant ecologist, and our volunteer management office in collaboration with the Conservancy for Cuyahoga Valley National Park has put in thousands of volunteer hours planting thousands and thousands of trees to try and fill in those gaps and help protect birds from the effects of habitat fragmentation. But um, yeah, we want this place, Cuyahoga Valley, to be a place where it's safe for birds to come and breed. <laughs> but getting there is, is a challenge. Um, go ahead, Doug. Yeah, and then this is just the final slide to just kind of leave it with. Um, so it was awesome that uh, we had that little talk about the bird friendly coffee, because that was kind of like the last slide, just seven simple actions to help birds. Like, what can we do? What can we all do type thing? Um, the, I don't know if you can read that, up, you know, from there, but keep cats indoors, use native plants, avoid pesticides, make windows safer, do citizen science, uh, reduce plastic use and drink shade grown coffee. So we'll have to definitely put a plug in for that coffee that you advertised earlier. I think there's one more, but yeah, there we go. So there's some shade grown coffee right there just to illustrate the difference but um yeah just maintaining that habitat um some acknowledgments like i said dr maria mar gutierrez ramirez she's out there uh she was awesome and she helped us a ton and megan so that kind of makes up our four-person team it's been great we're still working on it um dwight and ann chaucer they're uh great volunteers who have been around in the park for a long time um and yeah, they coordinate a lot of our, you, you, you all probably know them. They coordinate a lot of our bird censuses and they helped us, um, compile some of the data sets. They handed us some of the data sets, like physical hard copies. Um, Doug Bogus, he was with, uh, he still kind of is, I thought he was going to move to Arizona, but not sure. But with the greater Akron Audubon, uh, he, he handed over the summer census data and just gave us a lot of good information. He's been prowling around the park for a long time. And then just all the volunteers and eBirders who have contributed. And then I just, uh, you know, put our emails up there. If you guys, if you guys are interested in this project and, you know, have time available and, and uh, you know, want to help us track down some of these birds in coming years, um, just feel free to send an email about anything bird related to us. Um, we're hoping to get another project aside from the eBird thing that I kind of mentioned. Um, we don't have the permission, I guess, to do it yet. We don't have a way to to include um, public in this yet, but we're trying to get like a survey form that where people can go collect data for the uh, breeding evidence that we did last year. We just ran into a little hiccup with that, but we're hoping to be able to do that again and just have volunteers out just submitting data on anything they can find about some of our, our species and their breeding behaviors. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it. Does anyone have any questions? Sorry, did you have some? No, thank you. Anybody with a question in here? Do you have any questions? Do um, you have any questions? Ask them to unmute and, and speak if they have a question. Oh, okay. Yeah, if you could, uh, for those who are Zooming, uh, please unmute and pose a question, please, if any of you are out there. Hello? Oh. There you go. Thank you. I guess I can uh, ask a question. Um, I know the Cuyahoga Valley is planting lots and lots of trees, the shrub scrub birds and the grassland birds. What are you doing for those species and how much acreage are you setting aside for things like that? I could, I could start real quick and pass it to Ryan. He's going to have a better answer, but I'll also, I mean, the one thing we do have is the Coliseum and uh, like you said, Pine, Pine Hollow. Um, those are managed early succession um, as far as shrub stuff. I don't know if you have, I can answer it, but I, I think Ryan. Yeah. The, that's really like a, a, a thing we're trying to figure out. Right. And 
um, this data set, there's a couple of species that I think are, are kind of leading this conversation. The birds, right? People keep calling us about prairie warblers or whatever species. Um, another successional species, uh, the state endangered smooth green snake. So there's these species that require successional habitat. And in order to maintain successional habitat, you need a disturbance, right? Um, and as I mentioned in the, in the earlier slide, like the Park Service really leans into the idea of natural processes, right? So we're not Fish and Wildlife Service. We're not the Division of Wildlife. We're not going to go out and mow a certain way to promote a single species, right? But we want to maintain some type of disturbance. So we do use fire, so prescribed fire at at the Coliseum. Um, we have prescribed fire at Terra Vista and the Barrow Pit is another site. Um, we're working on expanding our ability to apply fire across the landscape. Um, we're now underneath um, the New River Gorge as our, as our lead on, on fire. And they've really helped us open up our fire management plan. But that is, that is like a, a really challenging thing. We don't have specific goals for managing and preserving like successional habitat. I think some of us understand the importance of those types of habitat. You know, you want to preserve forest songbirds. Well, forest songbirds, when they're done in the forest, they go into these shrubby scrub habitats for post-fledgling periods and, and whatnot. So it's a dynamic landscape. We definitely have sort of these, these goals that are battling with each other, um, planting more trees to improve forest habitat ultimately can reduce the successional habitat. So we like to hear from everybody else, um, but we don't uh, have goals specifically as of right now for successional habitat preservation. It's something that I, th I think we want to confront now because we're seeing, I mean, it's not just at the park, but, you know, regionally, the decline in successional associated species. Um, and with the park, you know, we're we're year forty or almost year fifty now in preserving these 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 areas, and we've gone through succession, and we're into forest stage in a lot of cases too. So that natural natural succession, creating those shrub scrub habitats, has gone beyond it now. So we're losing that habitat that way as well. So we're trying to figure it out. Do you have any ideas? <laughs> what do you want us to do? It's your land, right? <laughs> yeah, just a. Uh... One little thing to add to is like kind of like Ryan already said that we're hoping that once we get this report out, um, we w might make some recommendations, some habitat recommendations, which the park can then take with that what they will. And, you know, what gets deemed as natural process and with the expansion of the fire plan, we're just ho we're hoping that and we think it will um, this document will help kind of drive a little bit of that to make up for kind of what we're missing in the full picture. So. I can go on and on about that, but I'm I'm not going to. So because I know this is going to be on YouTube. So and Chris Davis will be watching. And and so like the, it's just a really interesting topic too, because we get calls about the prairie warblers. Are you guys concerned about the prairie warblers? Anybody looking at me about the prairie warbler? Yeah. So that's a cool one. Like it wasn't here 20 years ago. We didn't have it at the park and now it's here. So what is, what is our role and what is our responsibility for preserving that species on the landscape is what we're trying to figure out. Like if it is just a couple of males every year coming and hanging out, you know, we're not, is it worth, you know, changing our, our actions, our management actions to, to preserve that? Um, is it, is, is our, 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 are our actions actually negatively impacting that species as a whole and it, it, across the landscape? So that information about are they breeding successfully and where is that's why it's really important for us to, to understand that. And like Doug said, we might, we are definitely going to come out with management recommendations um, for birds and, and managing for uh, bird diversity at the park that will hopefully um, help balance all that the grassland species again like that's always the, this philosophical debate like should we be conserving grassland species in northeast ohio if they were not here historically well they're here now and the coliseum is a grassland because it's soil's terrible nothing else is going to grow there it required like a specific action to like make the park service say yes we are going to maintain this for for grassland birds and so uh yeah, we, we want to maintain that biodiversity, but figuring out how disturbance uh, fits into that um, uh, 
uh, picture is what we need to to work on. Yeah, is the Coliseum open to the public, and are there trails and parking if it is open? Yeah, so the entire national park, other than a couple of locations around waterfalls, are open. You can go wherever you want. Um, <laughs> there is not a like official well manicured parking lot, but you can park on the roadside or on the far west side there. Um, there is currently not a trail. Uh, there is a proposed trail. There was a proposed trail in the trail plan from to, like 2012. Um, we just got through with our community access plan, which some of you hopefully contributed to or, or followed along on. Uh, and in that, we proposed a you know viewing platform and a small trail. Our goal is to keep that area, make it more accessible. At least some of us have that goal. Uh, the park is challenged with managing all the trails that we do have. So there is some question about adding more trails, but um, yeah, accessibility up there, a, a trail would be tremendous. If you've walked around there, it's like an ankle breaker everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, but you're welcome to go there. I hope in the future we'll have a trail that's accessible to even people with limited mobility. So. Where is that Coliseum area? I hike a lot, but I, I have not heard of that. So it's uh, west of Peninsula on 303. So if you follow Pen uh, 303 west out of Peninsula up the hill after you pass the Highway 271, the Coliseum is that grassy area to the north. Oh, okay. Yeah, before you get to like Country Maid over there. Yeah, yeah then get ice cream afterward. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's a great spot. You know, I don't, do you want to hear more about it? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what, you said the uh, valley is open, Cuyahoga Valley is open to everyone. What about the railroad tracks at Station Road? I knew this I was one was told coming. I knew this one. There's was a coming. sign that says there's a you know a fee. So is that prohibited? So yeah, you are not allowed to walk on the railroad tracks. Okay, you never have been allowed. Oh. Uh, you are allowed to walk next to them. <laughs> exactly. Uh, it does create some challenges when you need to go over a bridge. Uh, uh, to get over Chippewa Creek to get to the, the wetlands that are down there. But yeah, it's, I, I don't quote me. I will send you the exact uh, line in the superintendent's compendium. I believe it's two feet from the edge of the railroad tie, five feet, four feet like next to, um, but yeah, that that's been a tough thing for us uh, to, to manage. We own the railroad tracks, but we are still, we don't get to make the rules. It's the federal railroad Administ federal railroad administration that tells us what needs to be done. And even like for us, it's become really challenging lately to figure out like how we can even use that, even for volunteers to go out to get access to do monitoring. Um, there's there's a lot going on. A lot of a lot of attention on the railroad right now. There's been for a couple of years now. Um, you might have seen in the news or on, on our website um, just posted yesterday. The Cuyahoga Valley Scenic Railroad is shutting down for the next two months to just address some of the safety concerns that they had about their operation. So uh, I, I would hope that we could someday figure out how to utilize the railroad tracks uh, to access certain areas. But yep, you were not allowed, but you can walk next to it. You heard me say it. If anyone asks you, I said you can walk next to it. That's what it says in the superintendent's compendium. It's recorded. Uh, yes. It, I mean, I'm just stating facts. This is not my opinion. Uh, you can walk next to the railroad track, uh, but don't walk on it. <laughs> and if you see a train coming and you're walking next to it, like their biggest concern is they want to know that you're seeing them. Like they don't want to run somebody over. So you don't like hide in the woods and jump out of them, stand off the railroad tracks. You can wave to them. You're not going to get in trouble. Walk next to the railroad tracks, but preferably, you know, I don't know. I, again, I, I can say this and I say this all the time. Like I love the fact that you can go wherever you want in a park, like the net, the Metro parks stay on the trail. You know, you take a step off, you can get a ticket right? You can go anywhere you want in the national park. There's some things you can and cannot do. You need to be safe. You need to be careful. You don't want to create social trails or Doug found a new mountain bike trail somebody created in Peninsula the other day, but explore the park, right? Get out there. Um, just be delicate when you're, when you are, so, but don't walk on the tracks. I did, you did record that part, right? No walking on the tracks. <laughs> no questions uh, in the chat or anything, nothing from, from our Zoomers. All right, I do have one more question, comment. Oh, okay, go ahead. Are 
Are there many grassland sparrows in Canada? Yeah, we have uh, Henslow sparrows. We have a pretty good breeding population at the Coliseum. There's another wheat field that's kind of privately run, but it's in the park boundary that gets Henslow sparrows. Savannah sparrows, hit or miss. Um, I don't know. I haven't seen any dick sizzle reports in a while, uh, but that's pretty much. Did she? Did they say rare sparrows or sparrows? Sparrow. Oh, sparrows. Oh, grass and sparrows. Yeah. Okay. I mean, field sparrows are kind of more of like a successional species, but uh, the two main grassland associates would be primarily the Henslow sparrows. Um, so yeah, that's a good. The Coliseum is a great site. If you want to go see grassland birds, go check it out. You got to learn the Henslow's call though, because. If you're trying to, I don't even know if I've ever actually seen one at the Coliseum. I've been going there for like over 10 years and I hear them all the time. But anyway, uh, yeah, Savannah, if, you, if you're if you lucky. All righty. Well, I, I want to send our deepest thanks to two excellent speakers. Great information. Um, we hope that some of you consider volunteering, maybe doing some of the surveys. Zoomers, think about it too. Um, and again, this will be recorded. You can look at it again if you did not get the um, emails, but I have them as well too. So you can always info at wcaudubon.org and I'll answer your questions. But thank you everybody for this evening. Thank you both. Enjoyed it a lot. Thanks for having us.